I'm going to invite up to the stage with me two distinguished authors who both have new books out on exactly this topic, but they take very different viewpoints on whether social media is opening up a whole new world of information to us and expanding our horizons, or whether we're crystallizing into small communities who only talk to each other and reinforce our own prejudices as a result. Up on the stage, I'll invite first Andrew Keane, who is the author of Digital Vertigo, how today's online social revolution is dividing, diminishing, and disorientating us. Uh, and also coming up to the stage is Nick Harkaway. His book is called The Blind Giant. He takes a much more positive view of how we can use social media and what he calls this age of marvels. And he's written a handbook for everybody who is trying to be human in the digital age. Uh, and copies of both these books are going to be available outside afterwards. To start us off, I'm going to ask each of our authors to give us a quick five minutes setting out their stall as to where they see we are with social media and what it's doing to us as a society. Then we'll discuss it a bit and, and bring in questions from the audience. So to start us off for five minutes, the author of Digital Vertical, Andrew Keane. Thank you very much, Sarah. Is that, can you hear me? Yeah? Um, oh, that's better. Thank you for uh, coming. It's hot. Um, I thought I would just uh, try and uh, tied together some themes from today's uh, presentations. I was particularly intrigued by a lot of the things that uh, Eric Schmidt said, so try and uh, talk about what he said. I thought the minister started in an interesting way when he talked about Britain and the 19th century. My book actually relies on the 19th century. I think we're living through a similar period of structural change, change which is um, fundamentally altering society and challenging the rights of the individual. What most concerns me in the digital age is not so much society. I don't even know, I don't, want, don't mean to sound like Mrs. Thatcher, but I don't really know what society means. What I care about is the impact of the social revolution on individuals, because societies are made up of individuals, and uh, I don't think of myself as a society, I think of myself as an individual. Uh, but we're living through a very similar time in terms of this transformational change. The Industrial Revolution also fundamentally altered the nature of things, and we needed to calibrate the Industrial Revolution. I, my book works off John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. I think we need an on-digital liberty to figure out how to integrate individual rights into our digital age. Um, so as Eric said, um, everything now is social. Most people in Silicon Valley acknowledge this fundamental shift from Web 2.0 a Google-centric world, a Google-centric uh, economy of links, to a Web3 world, which uh, Reid Hoffman describes as the ubiquity of personal data, a platform not of links but of likes. Now, we know that Google, as Eric acknowledged, Google Plus is trying to catch up with, uh, with, with Facebook. We have Twitter. But we have not only Twitter, Google Plus, Facebook, LinkedIn, but thousands, literally thousands of social companies which are making the web a place in which we, without any kind of anonymity, are defining ourselves. On the social web, then, everything is increasingly known about us. What we're eating, where we're going, what we're thinking, what we have done, what we will do, what we're watching. There's social television, social education, social eating, social driving, social bicycling. The web is in becoming, then, essentially social. That is the fundamental revolution that's going on. And in my view, that's very troubling. It's very troubling for a couple of reasons. Firstly, in the context of what Alex talked about, it's doing away with serendipity. I have a piece in this month's Atlantic about this. When everything is known about us, when we walk into a room and we're all on Highlight or Glancy or some of these other social location services, where, we, where, where your next door neighbor, who may be a stranger, you know through a mutual network, where you can find out what they're thinking, what their musical taste is, where they studied, what books they like, what books they don't like, where they go on their holidays. We're doing away with that mystery, that essential serendipity that defines the human condition. So I, I, I like what our Alex is doing. Uh, I think it's a kind of jest, but it does concern me that the social web is doing away with serendipity. More profoundly, though, and, I, and I'm borrowing Eric here. I don't know if he uh, would, would acknowledge what I'm about to say, but he talks about, in the social web, identity being defined by others rather than ourselves. 
And in my view, that is the most profound, troubling indictment of the social web. Our identities are defined by others rather than ourselves. And as Eric notes, and as noted in many other contexts, the internet, and the social web in particular, hasn't learned how to forget. So what we're, what we're doing, and, I, and I'm referring to, to Nick's wonderful book, The Blind Giant, being digital, uh, being human in a digital world, I absolutely, I may not agree with all uh, Nick's conclusions, we may disagree about some aspects of the internet, but I am fundamentally concerned about being human in a digital world, because if we are being defined by others, if everything is known about us, if we are indeed turning ourselves inside out, if publicness is replaced by privacy, then in my view, we are indeed doing away with what it means to be human, which is the cultivation of the self, the establishment of personality, which is achieved by ourselves internally and not by others. Have they got any more time? One more minute. So Eric said, uh, the big question is, what comes after social? He's right. We have a couple of alternatives. In my view, what I want to see coming after social is firstly a market business focus on privacy, a market business profile focus on establishing technologies, platforms, companies, apps that protect privacy, that monetize privacy. Google might not like me to say this, but I think we have to move away from a free economy where everything rests on advertising. Because in a data-rich economy, where you give the thing away for free, whether it's Facebook or Twitter or Google+, Plus or Search Plus Your World or any of these other free services, human beings and their data become the product in the social world. So we have to move away from that. And we have to, above all else, remind ourselves that being human means having secrets, being mysterious. Radical transparency was the kind of engineering of the human soul that was tried and failed tragically in the 20th century. We don't want to repeat that tragedy in the 21st in a digital environment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. We'll invite Nick to, to take a similar amount of time, about five minutes or so, to respond. Am I audible just through this? Am I, here we go. An individual, uh, since Andrew brought it up, is an incomplete part. If you follow your new scientist, you will have seen the editorial a couple of weeks ago, which said that empathy, culture, and language were three of the four defining features of what it means to be human. Those three things are impossible if you are an individual alone. If you are an individual alone, your grip on language will deteriorate. You will start to lose words, make up new words, and your understanding, the concepts behind those pieces of language will fade away. To be human is to be social. It's not that humans are all sociable. I'm not always very sociable. But the primary things that make us what we are exist not in an individual's relationship internally, unstimulated by the outside world, but in the intersections that we have with other people, with the culture around us, with the world around us. So the social revolution, more specifically, that we're talking about now, is a revolution on top of a revolution. Not just the 19th century, the 20th century were periods of radical change. And those changes rocked what it means to be a, an individual. They created in the 80s a, a cult of hyper-individualism, a sense that the individual was the basic building block of society, which it had never really been before. And so the, the social media revolution, the social revolution, comes on top of a string of radical changes which have disconnected us, made us feel that we don't know who we are anymore. The things which used to be our touchstones which Anthony Giddens identified in the 90s before the digital revolution really got, to, got started. The state, the nation state, your sense of identity came from that. The family, the nuclear family and the extended family, your sense of identity came from that. The location where you were born, you could grow up and die within a very small radius of where you came from originally. The church, all these things were how you located yourself in the social network, not a digital network, but the web work of community. And those things were threatened. The social media revolution came along. In part, it evolved out of a need to reconnect. 
And that is what we have. The technology could do a bunch of other things, but we chose this. And the reason we chose it is because we needed it. There's a great deal of discussion about social media making us lonely. I think the evidence is ambiguous. There's an Australian study which says that it ties you more closely to friends, but that people who use social media tend to report weaker relationships with family. The causality of that is unclear. You don't know whether it means you have a bad relationship with your family, so you turn to making friends online. And some of them are real friends, and some of them are friends that you stay in touch with closely. They're not just weak ties. Or whether, of course, having a, a strong social media presence dissociates you from your family. I believe the first. I, I share the angst about privacy. I really do. Um, I think the dilemma that Google faces, since we're in the Google Big Tent, is very strong. Here is a company which believes in using information to empower people, but its model depends on collecting information to give, to sell to companies so that they can influence choice. And influence choice not necessarily in the way which we would desire. I worry about choice in the sense that I think there is a trend in liberal democratic politics, neoliberal democratic politics, and in corporate life to say, we'll take the business of hard decisions away from people. But that obviously makes you bad at making decisions, and those decisions are at the heart of democracy and at the heart, in fact, of the free market. But what's been going on over these last few years is the single greatest gathering of empirical data about how we behave and how we make decisions which has ever taken place on an enormous scale. And that affords us the opportunity to take control of that understanding and to make decisions in the fullest knowledge that we have ever had, an understanding of how we make decisions, how we are, as Dan Ariely would have it, predictably irrational. And to understand our irrationality and not to be influenced by what are otherwise behemoths and titans of government which can influence us in ways we do not understand, do not even notice. Behavioral self-defense, if you like. But for me, it's about more than that. I don't believe you can separate the social media situation, the social revolution, from the technology which creates it and which goes alongside it. So I don't think you can lose social media and not also lose things like the Human Genome Project, which come out of the power of computing, out of science and discussion and so on. I think those things are so closely interrelated. In any case, you can't dial it back now. It is simply too late. But the potential that I see, the thing that makes this the most extraordinary time, is this extraordinary potential to reach out, take control of the decision-making process, understand who we are, and to begin to create the institutions, the software, the culture that we need to support the society we want. We don't have to wander around blindly anymore, hence the title of the book. We can reach out and say, OK, we can begin a process of iterative society-making. And we can be who we would rather be, rather than, let's be honest, the culture of the 20th century, the history of the 20th century is not the finest demonstration of the supremacy, the wonderfulness of the mind that we currently have. The way that we currently do our thinking is not made to look beautiful by the history of the 20th century. So I believe if we choose it, we can have a 21st century, which is magnificent. And I hope that you guys will make that happen. Thank you very much, Nick. Let's tease out a little more about uh, what you've both been writing about. Andrew, you described the, the great exhibitionism that people are volunteering for. It's not as yeah. though this is being forced out of them, the amount that they share. But you say it, it encourages narcissism and, and crystallizes people's viewpoints. How does that happen? Well, I, I, I have a two-sided analysis of this. Everyone always says, well, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. So there is the narcissism element, and my, that critique is a conservative one. It's really suggesting we need to be more Protestant or more puritanical uh, and, and less indulgent about ourselves. And someone was saying to me before, that we shouldn't think that we're the center of the universe. This new social media broadcast platform enables everyone to think that what they think and what they're doing and what they're having for breakfast is interesting and important, and it isn't. So there is that conservative element, and they should learn how to, uh, they'd be better off um, learning from others rather than simply broadcasting themselves. That's also part of a crisis of mainstream media. So that's a conservative critique. 
which is, is the easy critique, and it's the obvious one. I've made it, lots of other people have made it. But I think there's a more interesting critique as well about what's going on, is that as we shift from this industrial to a knowledge economy in the 21st century, as the firm is increasingly replaced by all of us being more, more and more self-employed, as we have the fragmentation of traditional communities and more and more mobility, as we have more and more of a, of a kind of, and I think Nick and I would agree on this, a, a, a radically individualized culture. These platforms become essential for us to be on, to peddle our brands, to peddle our wares, whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. And we are, we are emerging into what's known as, as the reputation economy. And platforms like clout are the metrics, are the, the mechanisms for this reputation economy. Cathay Pacific in uh, San Francisco Airport have just institutionalized a, a thing in their, in their lounge where you get to sit in their first class lounge if you have a clout score above 50. Now, it's kind of silly and funny and marketable and all the rest of it, but I think it does speak of the way in which this world is going. I wanted to try Highlight and Glancy for my piece about serendipity. You can't be on Glancy or Highlight anymore uh, unless you're on Facebook. So it's incre it, we don't really have a choice about Facebook anymore. If we want to play in this social world, and we need to, we have to, then we need to be on these platforms. So I think the, the choice element is less obvious than it actually seems. We don't have the free will that we'd like. Maybe the one billion poor people that Eric Schmidt talks about can afford not to be on the internet, and a few hundred thousand very wealthy people can afford not to be on it but everyone else needs to be on this ret uh, reputation attention platform. And if we have no choice, but you're more positive about these um, types of social media, obviously, but even you talk about the need to protect and, and keep private something of your life, your, your heart space, as you describe it. Do you think people know how to do that? I think it's not always made clear to them how to do it. I think, uh, I mean, I, I have wrangles with Facebook all the time uh, when I'm trying to kind of protect my, uh, the, the space that I want to keep uh, from Facebook, um, and I found myself the other day entering fictitious trips that I'd made so that the map, which I can't take off my page, would have um, uh, a less accurate understanding of where I live and so on, because I, I, I'm not crash hot keen. My wife has a job in the human rights law industry. I'm not totally keen on everybody knowing exactly where she lives either. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's absolutely, it's not always simple, but I do believe that actually uh, it is possible to uh, carve out a space that you want to keep for yourself. It's true that you do have to be, I think, uh, to, a, to a great degree uh, connected as we move forward. Uh, you have to be present in a social media environment, but you don't have to put your entire life there if you don't want to, and you certainly don't have to make yourself entirely vulnerable. I think we need to push very hard for greater user controls, and those things are antithetical to uh, a model which involves selling data. Um, but it's, it's one of those things. There is always a trade-off. And the thing about these situations is it's a very strange thing to be having this particular conversation instead of the other conversations of things we ought to be worrying about. We should be worrying about, um, for example, the fact that if you live in the city, you're 39% more likely to have mood disorders, 28% more, li more likely to have anxiety disorders, and twice as likely to become schizophrenic. That's, those are statistics which terrify me about the way that we live. I'm less concerned about the kind of more ambiguous data that you get for, think, uh, for problems that people have with, with social media. Well, that's because we don't have the data yet, presumably. I mean, we might be having this conversation in 10 years' time with an entirely different set of statistics about what's been caused by people's interactions with, with social media. How can we rely on the people who provide these platforms ever to allow people to protect themselves and make it easier to find a private space within this? We're in this room. There's probably someone who can answer that question. I, I think the thing is, it's not a question of allowing them, I, sorry, of, of them allowing us to do it. I think it's a question of us insisting upon it. And this is the thing that I find very strange about people, uh, about the interaction of uh, various people, various industries, and so on with the digital environment is there's a tendency to say, we'll wait until someone fixes that, or we'll, you know, we'll hope that someone else fixes that. And actually, you have to be more proactive. Um, you have to say, OK, this is the thing that we want, and this is the thing that we require, and this is the world we want, so we'll go and make it. Um, and that, to me, is actually a very positive thing. It, it, it requires activism from us. 
And Andrew, is that going to happen? I mean, you, you admit yeah, one that, has to be that, connected, so we, we can't just ignore all of this. Can, can we demand that it operates the way we want? Well, that sounds a bit Camden Town. I mean, <laughs> what does that mean? You go out, we demand it. I mean, I well, can demand lots world, of things. News of the world was closed by people who, who told advertisers that well, they didn't want to be the associated news, because with the news that. of the world broke the law. They committed, well, I they mean, committed a, a sin which people found morally distasteful. The law comes later. The first thing was they were seen to have hacked Millie Dowler's telephone, and people found that morally repugnant, so they told car advertisers and so on, we won't be a part of this. Because they knew it had happened. I mean, I think possibly Andrew's yeah. point about what a lot of what's going on is we just don't well, realize I mean, what of our information is being I, taken I think from that us. consumers need to be more realistic as well. I think that there is a lot of, and, and I blame Bill Thompson mostly for this, um, there's a lot <laughs> of, where is he? Uh, uh, there is a lot of ideology about free on the internet. The idea that, you know, we can have everything and it can be free. So users, consumers have taken for granted this issue of free services, free content. It's one of the reasons why the music industry I'm a defender of has been decimated. And I think the problem with so-called free services like Facebook and Google Plus uh, and Twitter is consumers take it for granted that they can have everything, that they should have these free services which are very cool and work well and, and make them happy and they can have fun and have value and at the same time they should own their own data and that these companies should never ever take advantage of them and consumers have to wake up to the reality. Google's done a good job branding itself as a public interest company. Facebook's trying to do the same thing. But these companies are big data companies. They're for-profit companies. They're in the business of making huge amounts of money for themselves and their, their shareholders. And consumers have to understand that if they really care about their own data, then they need to pay for services which explicitly and unambiguously states that nothing will ever be done with that data. So consumers have to wake up as well. It's all too easy to blame everything on corporations. I think governments have a role, and I think companies like, uh, and I, I, I give Facebook, the, uh, uh, Google, the benefit of the doubt. I think that the guys at Google Plus are trying to, with their circles, are trying to protect privacy, certainly more than Facebook. But what I, I'm most hopeful about these new wave of companies, the ones that are coming after social, that are making privacy, secrecy, the core of their product. Because I think those are the ones that consumers are going to embrace, provided they're willing to compromise, provided they're willing to pay. That's a good point to throw it out to the audience. Do we have Bill Thompson with us? <laughs> may, may as well give him the first question as he was got a name check. It's not ah, him. yes, we do. Yeah, I, I was sitting carefully at the back trying to cool down uh, like everyone else. Um, obviously, you misrepresent my position, but only for good effect. <laughs> because the, the dilemma over what we can expect to get and where we put the boundaries is one that continuously faces us. And so really, I think the distance between the two of you is not nearly as extreme as you might like to, to pretend for the, for the purposes of our conversation today. And really, my question would be, what is your common ground? How can you two come together to give all of us who are listening to you some sense of how we should start to move forward as we live increasingly online? You do have some common ground between the well, two. Well, I mean, my, as I said, I think my common ground is that Sometimes I get portrayed as a Luddite, but I'm not. I think that I, in my book, I keep on quoting the fictional Sean Parker, who at a sort of a, a, a neo-Hegelian moment, while he's sniffing some cocaine off a young lady's chest in the social contract, a social network says, first we lived on, in villages, then we lived in cities, and now we, we're going to live on the internet. And he's right. The 21st century is the place where we are going to live more and more on the internet. So I love Nick's notion of being human in a digital world? That's the fundamental question. That's why I like, for example, technology that will degenerate. When Eric says the internet doesn't know how to forget, it doesn't know how to forget right now, but humans know how to forget. The worlds that humans have always made know how to forget. So there are technologies now that are being developed which will also degenerate over time and learn how to forget. So I think that being human in the digital world is not only a question of how to be human from an individual point of view, but how to architect a digital world for humans. We're the ones building it. It's not robots, right? Not even the artificial cars. 
I think if you're looking for common ground, it has to be surely this, this idea that uh, this is something which we collectively have to do, that we have to make the social world, the digital world, become something which we can live with. Um, I mean, I think if you want to know what I think going forward, I don't think it's about what the next technologies are. I think it's about people starting to respond to them and, and decide that they want to control them. I think, you know, somebody said to me the other day that this isn't really a book about technology in the sense it's a, it's a book about citizen activism. And I begin to think that's true. Obviously, it's, it's cast in the form of a technological discussion. But a, when we're talking, when Andrew's talking about um, uh, this kind of sense of uh, whether, it, well, the various things, the narcissism and so on, which, are, which he sees building in the world that we have, and there's data to back that up, I see that as based in the 80s. I see that as, as the consequence of, of a kind of cultural change that was taking place before digital came along. And similarly with um, the issue of, of uh, things being free, I think we were encouraged to believe in the 90s, not particularly by the digital world, but actually by governments for whom it was you know, incredibly advantageous for us to believe that we get richer and richer, uh, and to a certain extent by banks for, you know, that, who wanted us to accept credit because that was what they needed to sell then onwards as a, as a financial instrument. Um, you know, to believe that that was what was happening, and things have a cost. Uh, and I think going forward, you know, we're going to have to decide how we want to meet those costs. There are other costs which we haven't even touched on. Um, you know, but I think it, this, the next step for me is a reasonable understanding of how we want to live and how we want to pay for it. Because God knows that's the big question in the world, even outside the digital There's environment. There's one other thing that I think we share, which. Now, I, 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 I'm a defender of classic, the classic liberal individual in, the, in, in John Stuart Mill's sense. But that doesn't mean that I'm a libertarian. That doesn't mean that I fetishize the individual. And I, I actually see two things going on simultaneously in parallel, and they're in, a, in an odd way bound up with one another. And this both comes out of Silicon Valley. We have this r increasingly radicalized ideology of individualism driven by this kind of Randian libertarianism that comes out of the valley, and at the same time, the cult of the social. When you, when you think about people like Zuckerberg, he is simultaneously a libertarian and a, a sort of a fetishizer of the social. Because for many of these people, the social is just a reflection of themselves. It's just a mirror. And these social networks are things you can dip in and out of, and they're just, they're just mirrors to themselves. So I, what I want, I'm not against the social, but what I want is something, and I, and I think we would agree here, we, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but what, I want something genuinely social, not something that has been fetishized as social so a small group of people can make a fortune and, and as individuals we can all think better about ourselves. Let's take another question. Right in the middle we have a hand up. Um, hello. I just wanted to um, make an observation about the reputational economy uh, that you've mentioned. Um, I think that the reputational uh, economy always existed. Uh, if we think back at the 18th century, uh, your reputation was linked to your family's name, the school that you went to. Um, networks always existed and were always very important in getting a job or getting a known in society. What happens now is that um, this reputation economy is democratized um, via LinkedIn. I can tell people what my skill set is, and I don't need them, um, they don't need to know my dad in order to find out about me. And I can export that information wherever I go, even if I immigrate to another country or if I seek a job abroad. That's a, well, that's a very interesting well, one about people who can control their reputations. But I mean, well, I'd yeah. like you to talk also about what's happening with well, kids who are putting everything out there now who are too young to realize the reputations they're building for themselves in later life. Well, that's a fair point. I think it, it's a really interesting issue. Um, what I fear, and, and Zuckerberg wants this, he wants us to go back to this giant dorm room. The, uh, the idealists think that you can have a truly de democratized world if, if, every, if everyone knows everything that we've ever done, that would be a pure reputation economy. Reid Hoffman talks about this, because then people would know whether or not to trust us. But I don't want to live in that kind of world, this giant village. I want to go back to the city, to its anonymity. Uh, Reed, uh, Eric Schmidt once said, well, kids will have to reinvent 
their identities and rename themselves at 18 because you do things between your 15 and 18 that you want the world to forget. It's hard to know sometimes with him whether he was joking or not, but the fact is, is that we can't reinvent our identities. In a sense, when Mark Zuckerberg says, you only have one identity, he wants us to only have one identity in that reputation economy. So you're right in a sense that we're living in a world where you don't depend on your parents and the old networks of a traditional feudal order. But I, I, I'm not convinced that's a world I want to live in. I don't want everyone knowing everything I've ever done. I don't want to be able to be pointed out that, uh, you know, there's obviously, all, all, every, we, we all know every kind of example we can throw out there. Um, it's not a forgiving world, particularly in the culture we live in, which tends to be very spiteful. We, we've seen so many examples of people who's, who, who have had bad stories thrown out in social media, and one way or the other, it's wrecked our lives. So if we were more forgiving, more generous as human beings, then I might be more sympathetic to the reputation economy. But I'm very fearful that, um, that, it, that it doesn't allow us to invent and reinvent ourselves, which I think is one of the cores of a free society. I think people our age who grew up without the internet, I think, are sometimes quite frightened by what um, our children are, are prepared to share out there with their friends, even if they're not breaking any rules or laws or anything, just enjoying themselves and wonder what this is going to look like when they apply to university or jobs and people all have access to this information. Are we wrong to be worried about that? Will, it, will there be a level playing field because everybody's done that? I don't think we're wrong to be worried about that. I mean, I, I kind of, I think Charles Arthur actually um, nailed this one the other day in The Guardian. Um, saying that this is, in a sense, a kind of parenting issue. That, you know, what you do at that point is you, you bring the computer into the communal space and you say, you know, this is, this is an activity which is kind of uh, something that happens publicly. And if it's going to happen publicly, you know, online, it's also going to happen publicly in the house. I think, I mean, the pornography discussion which took place this morning, you know, I mean, I think Charles was originally writing about that, but it applies to most things. You know, there are things which you can't legislate for because you would have to intrude too entirely into the home, into people's lives. Um, and, you know, actually, it has to be solved at ground level. It has to be solved between individuals, and it has to be a question, if you're talking about children, it has to be a question between parents and kids. Now, that may be personally difficult, and it may be a challenge, but, I mean, frankly, if, I mean, I've got, a, my daughter isn't at this stage yet, she's only 19, 20 months old, but frankly, if you didn't think that parenting was going to be a challenge, somebody misinformed you. Um, you know, not you, but... No, no, but it, it's, uh, it's it, the point at which they're going and quite rightly making their own lives as they move home and go to university. You shouldn't be controlling everything they do, but they just, you, you worry if they're being mindful well, This is actually very do. interesting because it brings up one of the kind of weird things people occasionally say is the young people don't care about privacy. And, and it's untrue. There was actually, there was an a interesting discussion about this earlier, I think, which was being put around on Twitter. Um, the, there was a BBC thing where they said, you know, would you be okay with, with um, your parents kind of having access to your mobile phone calls and, you know, controlling your mobile access and so on? And they went, no! Um, well, you know, of course you wouldn't. It, it, but at the same time, that is always a trade-off. It's, it's always, with, when you're dealing with, with the relationship between parents and children, it's always a kind of, uh, you know, my house, my rules versus trying to give people enough sovereignty. It's not easy. But none of this is easy. And that's actually the kind of where I sort of start to become wary, and one of the things that I kind of really enjoyed about Digital Vertigo is the sense that there is this sense that everything should be easy, and it's not. Easy decisions are decisions we should be frightened of, because a lot of the time now it means that someone is trying to sell us something, not whether it's for money or it's a political idea. This is where I become uneasy about nudging, this idea that when if you have enough information about how people make decisions, you can then push them into decisions they might otherwise not make, but which you think they would wish to think they would make. Um, and that I've become very uneasy about. It's always a trade-off, and we just have to be on the right side of it. But easy is, to me, a flag of the wrong one. Does anybody have any comments or questions? At microphone number one's at the ready. Yeah, uh, this, is, this is from a while back now. But just sort of thinking aloud, uh, and particularly thinking about Andrew's mention of kind of paid privacy, effectively, as, a, as an emergent property. Uh, you mentioned piracy as an example of the, the desire for freedom. And is there something in the development of how piracy is practiced that sort of speaks to a similar thing? You know, that uh, it started out with, with mass piracy, or at least what looked like mass piracy at the time. And as the, the consequences sort of came into, into 
existence, people started moving to things like Bitdefender and BT Guard and you know, concealing their identity, buying VPN access. Um, and in the same way, I guess, when you talk about paid privacy prioritizing applications, are you thinking about kind of things like uh, Appleseed and Diaspora and these things which haven't quite worked out? Uh, but, you know, but are those the kind of the precursors of the, the movement that you're, you're, you're anticipating or hoping for? Andrew. Well, I think maybe a better example is Spotify uh, or Rhapsody um, or even iTunes, you know, especially if iTunes goes to a, a subscription model uh, where there has been a shift, you're right, from people illegally downloading stuff because it's a bit dodgy to actually paying for the thing. Um, but it is... I do think we have to rethink this, this, as I said, this ideal of the free. You know, no one ever thinks that, well, this is free in a sense, Google's paying for it, right? But they're getting something out of it. But we don't demand free in any other sphere, so why should we demand it on the internet? It's one of the big fallacies. So I, I do think it's something that should be challenged on lots of levels. And even the free services, I mean, this is an argument I made in my other book in, in Cult of the Amateur. Free services like Wikipedia, I don't think really benefit anyone. I don't think they benefit the, the professional creator. They're not paid. The products themselves aren't always very reliable. So I, I just think we need to be much more aggressive. I think it's in the Internet's interest for it to become a paid. doesn't mean it has to become a walled garden. doesn't mean it has to become like television. Uh, but it does mean that we need to be more explicit about business models. Does anybody else want to come in with anything? Ah, we've got a question in the middle there. Hi there. Um, so um, you've talked about the way that, sorry, this is to, uh, to Andrew. Uh, you talked about the way that uh, people seem to want something for free um, and that maybe there's a duplicitous uh, intent behind the offer uh, of the companies to provide something for free. But actually, I think a lot of companies are very upfront about the fact that their service is effectively a transaction and that they're providing you with a service in return for your data. Well, I, uh, give me an example. Where, what company, is there a company out there that is explicitly upfront about saying, we'll give you this for free and in exchange you're giving us your data? What, what company are you thinking of? Google. Where do they say it? On, uh, for example, the Google blog or any number of the uh, marketing and PR branches Well, you saw the, uh, the public the response to Search Plus Your World and the way in which most people are very wary and uncomfortable with Google's attempt to knit together their social search engine with their email, with YouTube, with their other services. Uh, and I, I, I haven't found a place on the Google website which explicitly says that. I mean, LinkedIn, for example, its terms of service is 6,000 words, and you would really have to hire a lawyer to read it. So what, what I think companies need to do is simplify their terms of service, but at the same time, I mean, I never read terms, I'm not perfect by any means, I never read terms of service. Who here ever reads terms of service? We have about four hands in there, well, yes. I strongly suspect a high proportion of Google employees who just had their hands in the You're air. You're the ones <laughs> writing them, right? But I, I, I do think it's important to simplify those terms of service. I don't think there's anything bad. Also, I, I think it's easy to vilify companies like Google or Facebook if they are, quote, unquote, they're not really selling data, but leveraging the, the amount of data they have to increase their revenue. I don't think there's anything wrong with that as long as they explain it. I think there's a, uh, a kind of, there's an interesting test to do on yourself when you're using a service which is free and you know, or you, you know, you, you probably expect that your data will get used. I mean, if you're in this room, you probably do. Um, which is to ask yourself, you know, if I was paying 10 pounds a month for this service, you know, uh, that would be 120 pounds a year. Do I value my data higher than 120 pounds a year? And the answer for me is always, almost always, yeah, I do. You know, that personal data is worth more to me than that money. Um, so that's, you know, I, I try to lock down the privacy settings. And, that, and that's why, actually, I, I think you're right, and I would agree with you. But I fear that the, the five billion people that Eric Schmidt is welcoming onto the internet in a few years' time, most of those 
will be less willing to pay that 120 pounds because less they able to pay that less able pounds. they don't have that kind of disposable income so as more and more of the developing world goes online and as their issue of identity and the data about them i think they're even more sensitive i gave a speech uh, to some human rights people in uh, Oslo a year ago, and there were a lot of Africans in the audience, and I was explaining to them the, uh, you know, the personal data and the impact of this on society, and they would just, uh, you know, they, well, a couple of them came up to me afterwards and said, well, in our societies, this is unimaginable, because privacy is so essential that, that, that this would undermine the, the essential fabric of our, of our societies. So, in many ways, the great drama of the internet, the socio-cultural and political drama of the internet, I fear, is yet to come. With that, it's with that five billion that's about to come online. Now we have a couple more minutes left before we come to a close. We'll grab some e either either comments or questions. We've got two at the back, and we'll take the one at the very back, and then the lady who's in front. Uh, sorry, Nick Pickles from yeah. Big Brother Watch. Um, interesting question on the who explicitly asks for your data. Um, currently, health insurance companies are offering people incentives to hand over their supermarket loyalty cards. Um, no guessing why. Um, my question is more, what do you think it is that makes people willingly hand over information to companies that if the government asked for it, we'd all run a mile and there'd be riots and we go, no, why does the government need to know that? But we're happily handing it over to commercial companies and then the government just gets it from the companies anyway. Let's bear that in mind and take this other question from this lady here and then that'll be the end of the questions. Hello, um, Becky Allen from the Hansard Society. Um, I was just interested to hear from Nick um, about what mechanisms he thinks we can use that would be effective to actually force the creators um, of these platforms that we use to actually demand that, that they take our, um, our sort of protection of our privacy and our data more seriously because we are actually the product. I mean, what actual um, leverage do we have? How could we actually make that work and make them listen to us? Uh, so I'll, I'll ask you to address that first because it comes in. We think we're the customers of these products, aren't no, we? But not. we're not. No, we're, no, the, no. we're the products and the advertisers are the clients. Absolutely. I, I think the only answer is as an individual, you have very little power to make that happen. Um, obviously, as a group, as a member of a group of people who are large enough to have an effect on whether people actually use the service, how they use the service, you can control, you, you can demand much more. This is one of those situations where we as individuals, whether it's in a political context or a, a, an economic context, we have limited power unless we're particularly celebrities or very, 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 very wealthy or whatever. But as members of a group of like-minded people, we have considerably more power. And that is, as far as I can see, that is the only way we can affect things, is to find other people who believe the same thing and make, a, you know, use an organization like 38 Degrees. If there isn't one that does what you wanted to do, create an organization like 38 Degrees. This is why I say we need to create the institutions that will support the society we want to live with. Because, and, and this is why, incidentally, I believe that social media is magnificent, because it allows this to happen. Um, you know, uh, the only answer is collective action, and that makes me sound then suddenly like my friend China Mieville, who stands, you know, uh, for the left alliance in, in elections. But I, I, I really think the only answer is together. And re referring back to the, the, the previous question, people understand the value of their data and the needs to keep it private because he's right. We wouldn't hand it over willingly to government, so why do we to corporations? Well, I. I I'm not sure if we don't hand it over willingly. I mean, governments, governments' eyes are growing big in this personal data space as well. Uh, we don't hand it over to internet companies because I think certain internet companies, uh, some, some in this room, have figured out a very clever marketing scheme for presenting themselves as, as, as on the side of the consumer, as being public interest. And I don't think ultimately that benefits them or the consumer. There needs to be more honesty in terms of, not honesty, but more explicitness in terms of what these companies are about. Can I just add one thing to Nick's point? I agree with Nick about the value of social media, but I have to think we all show, should understand that there's a problem, that, the, that this kind of radical individualism that's driving social media has been very, very ineffective in terms of 
building viable long-term political organizations. I write about this in my book. The Occupy movement has not led to the creation of a coherent, viable political movement. These are, th these are social media kind of tsunamis that erupt, uh, go on Twitter, have a month or two in the limelight, and then go away. So what we need to figure out is how to build more long-term political organize. It's not, you know, you're, you, it's not just about the will. It's about organization. It's about commitment. Uh, and at the moment, whether it's the, uh, you know, the Arab Spring, whether it's the Occupy movement, whether it's many of these other political, political um, groups that have come out of social media, they're all, they're all failing. They're all failing to go from the idea, the initial original promise, the kind of culture of self-congratulation, into something more long-term and viable. And that's the challenge. Can very very briefly, and then we'll need to wrap up. So uh, the thing about that is that the most difficult and dangerous moment for revolution is not a moment of uh, the moment of tumult. It's the moment afterwards when you try to deliver on the promise. And it turns out you made 1,500 different promises to a population of 50 million, whatever, and those are in conflict. The reason I think that social media um, things like Occupy social media movements don't endure in that way is because they are not, in the first place, uh, movements with a political agenda which is coherent. They are a direct reflection of the things that people feel and believe. And that actually makes them incredibly much, much more representative um, than revolutionary politi political movements traditionally are. Um, and actually, I think what we need to do is find a way to continue that dialogue between many, 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 many people. Uh, because otherwise, you simply get a, a return to the, the kind of revolutionary politics of the 20th century where everyone burns cars in the street, a lot of people die, and then abruptly, everything is exactly the way it was with a new set of guys at the top. And the thing that gives me hope is the possibility that we might, be able, we might learn to transform temporary, free-form social media movements, which are just expressions of how people feel, into something which becomes a functioning system which works that way, rather than yielding up to the same old, same old. Nick, Andrew, we'll, uh, we'll need to wrap it up and leave it there. Thank you very much to both of our authors. Our books are, uh, are out now and available to buy, but uh, as a special treat, we have signed copies uh, of each of the books, uh, which will be available in the foyer on your way out. And um, that's the end of the last session for the day. So we'll say thank you very much to both of our authors and that fascinating discussion. Thank you.